got plenty of fluids, both um, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, to get through this. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Brittany, for that introduction and, and the invitation to come talk to you guys today. It's a real pleasure to be back in Florida. So I was a graduate student at UF, um, took a slight departure to the West Coast, um, see California for a bit, uh, but it's great to be back in Florida and St. Pete um, in, a, in a marine community. Uh, at Stanford, I was in the College of Medicine in the Department of Genetics where everybody else was stu studying human genetics and we were the kind of the black sheep doing coral bacterial symbioses. Um, so it's great to be in this environment again. So I want to talk to you today about uh, some brief stories looking about corals and you'll see sea anemones uh, and their microbial symbionts and kind of taking a model systems approach to these dynamic interactions that are going on uh, in these systems and how they all come together. So, of course, I have to set this in the context that we are not just animals, right? We are animals with our associated microbes, both the eukaryotes, the prokaryotes, the viruses, the fungi, the archaea, uh, interactions and evolution of all of these systems together, and, of course, our interaction with our surrounding environment. And so the holobiont that I've been spoke focusing the last 10 to 14 years of my life, I guess, on is the coral holobiont, and of course we talk uh, specifically about the coral itself, the animal polyp with their tentacles that they use for particle suspension feeding, and the dinoflagellate algae, the symbiodinium that live inside the gastrodermal cells of the host, produce copious amounts of photosynthesis that then is shunted to the, the coral animal, used for its own metabolism. Uh, in response, the symbiodinium is getting a nice house um, to, to live in, as well as getting nutrients that are coming from the animal host. So this partnership has been well classified, well studied, um, and we're starting to finally understand kind of the dynamic interaction between these parts, but of course we can't ignore the fact that, and I'm sorry I'm not displaying viruses here for Maya's group, um, but of course they are associated microbes, the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses, that are uh, definitely playing a role in this in this holobiont and this symbiotic interaction, um, but it's really been in the last probably 15 or so years that we've really become to appreciate the role of these microbes in this kind of holobiont and holobionts uh, within the whole realm of biology now. And so I got in, uh, interested in this as I was starting graduate school and, and not knowing much about corals other than I love to go scuba diving on them. Um, and then really kind of got into this idea that the bacteria are actually doing something cool. Um, and so I've, I've never really looked back. So of course the, the ecosystem that I, I, I focus on are, are the coral reefs. Obviously aesthetically beautiful, critically important ecosystems for coastal management, uh, coastline protection, food sources. This provides protein for about a million people, or a billion people, uh, globally at least. Um, but are also extremely fragile ecosystems, as we've uh, come to realize in, in at least the last year or year and a half when talking about the global El Nino event, um, the massive bleaching that's been plaguing the, the Western Pacific. Um, and so we can go from that pristine coral reef environment to something that looks more like this. As corals experience various stressors, they can break down that symbiosis between the coral and those uh, symbiotic algae. Uh, is called coral bleaching and so here we see the denuded coral skeleton um, the corals themselves are basically translucent so we see the white calcium carbonate skeleton when we're devoid of the algal symbionts now if the stress is, is short enough corals can actually recover either they won't bleach to entirety and they may have a few symbiodinium in their tissues re remaining and if conditions return back to favorable conditions those symbiodinium can repopulate or the coral may be able to acquire new symbionts from the environment and, and rebound. The problem being, as is the case with the El Nino event, we've got these massive warm waters that are sitting over these reefs for weeks at a time, um, stressing the corals out, and eventually, if they're without their symbionts for too long, they can succumb to mortality, and you'll get complete decimation of, of reefs. Of course, this is not just based on the breakdown of that two-partner symbiosis, but we know now that microbes definitely have the ability to alter their host physiology. And so just taking a, a, a detour into the realm of coral diseases, um, we've got multiple coral diseases. So this is white pox infecting a crop or corals that's bacterially derived. We've got white syndrome and um, vibrio-induced bleaching by vibrio-corolyticus and vibrio-shiloi pathogens. 
We've got black band disease, which has been ubiquitous across the Caribbean. Um, it's a consortia of bacteria and cyanobacteria that make their way across the coral colony as this black mat eating away at the, at the brown um, coral tissue here, leaving behind the skeleton. We've got white bands uh, diseases that have been also plaguing a cropper corals, uh, white plague, and then also aspergillosis of coral sea fans, which is a, a soil-based fungus that's made its way into the marine environment and started causing disease in these Gorgonian sea fans. And so it's clear that both these microbes both have a potential to maybe benefit their hosts and structure the overall uh, composition of the holobiont, but also we can get uh, instances where if the corals are already compromised, we may have um, potential for altering the physiology um, to the detriment as well. And so some of the questions that I've been asking over the years have been, how do native coral-associated microbes help to influence the physiology of the holobiont? So what are the members that are normally associated with this healthy holobiont? What are they and what are they doing? And how are they maybe altering um, the physiology of that holobiont? So what species are present? What are they doing? And then can they and do they protect the host from invading opportunistic pathogens? So some of these pathogens that were causing those diseases that I just put up are not um, normal pathogens or not always pathogenic. So they're not obligate pathogens. There are bacteria that are opportunistic, and if the opportunity arises and they can establish a niche, they will outcompete the native microflora and be able to, to start to cause a disease. And so what are the role of these coral-associated native bacteria uh, in protecting the, the host from these invasions? And then towards uh, kind of the beginning of my PhD, uh, got in this idea of can we use model systems to answer some of these questions. So I was a coral biologist interested in studying corals, but I was taking a more uh, pathogenic coral disease approach to some of my studies. Uh, and that meant I had to select corals from the reef, bring them back to the lab, and dump pathogenic bacteria on them, really killing them. And this was a time when a lot of coral species were listed under the threatened uh, status under the Endangered Species Act. And so it was becoming more and more difficult to convince NOAA and national, uh, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary to give me permits to bring those corals back into the lab to kill them in order to save them, right? And so um, that's when I, I contacted John Pringle out in Stanford, who was pushing this small sea anemone as a new model system to try to study corals in the lab and get at some of the cellular and molecular mechanisms that are driving some of these interactions. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, some work there. So I first just want to set the stage. Uh, and, and so here's a presentation outline. I um, want to tell the first story is just looking at this idea of using this small sea anemone aptasia as a model system for cnidarian host interactions with both opportunistic and potentially beneficial bacteria. And so can we use this as a surrogate model for studying these interactions that we see on coral? Um, also look at uh, a story that we, we focused on uh, looking at the roles of these native microbes and the ability f uh, of them to combat or inhibit pathogenic infection um, by one of these opportunistic pathogens, Serratia marcescens. So this is actually a human pathogen that's made its way out into the coral reef environment and uh, causes that white pox disease that I showed you. And then I'll get into a little bit of work that I uh, was doing at Stanford, looking at kind of the host side of things and looking how its gene expression is, is altered in response to some of these stressors and some of the potential roles that microbes may be influencing um, some of the changes that we see. So just to start with a, a kind of a pitch on why we're using Aptasia as a model system for coral and, and why we need a model system for corals. Um, and so this picture is a slight exaggeration, right? But uh, uh, corals do come in inconvenient sizes. And so it's, it's basically impossible for me to bring a coral like this back into my lab, keep it alive, and, and actually do any sort of manipulative experiments on it. Um, they're incredibly slow growing. So some species grow slower than a centimeter a year. And so I don't know how long your PhDs or postdocs were, but mine were not that long. And so using these guys, you know, growing them up from an individual polyp to a colonial size, the size of this podium, could take 100 years. Um, and nobody's got that kind of time. Um, they're difficult to maintain. So the reason that corals are uh, in, the, in the area of the globe that they are is because there's not that much historically fluctuation in temperature, salinity, some of these conditions that are very um, narrow guided for these corals to survive. And so it's often difficult to maintain those type of environments in the lab 
and give them everything that they need to thrive. Um, and so again, it's hard to bring these back into the lab and, and replicate a coral environment uh, in a more laboratory setting. They're also, of course, hard. They secrete this large calcareous skeleton, which uh, is good for the, the three-dimensional structure and habitat of coral reefs, but it makes it really difficult if you're trying to study the bacteria that live inside the tissues, and you've got to get through this calcium carbonate skeleton to try to macerate the tissue or to try to put this under a microscope uh, and see what's going on. And then, of course, for reasons that I already alluded to, now corals are protected. So as we're experiencing more and more stress, governments are putting regulation and restrictions on the sampling that is possible for coral. And it's becoming more and more difficult, which is a good thing, to, to bring these samples back into the lab. And so from this, um, John Pringle in 2004 out at Stanford kind of um, took his career from a yeast geneticist model systems guy and wanted to put his, his um, mark on coral biology and decided to start using the small sea anemone Aptasia as a model system. So how does Aptasia differ from coral? So they come in and really convenient sizes for experimentation. So they can be uh, a couple millimeters to a couple centimeters in size. They're individual polyps. So we can think of an uh, individual Aptasia polyp as an individual coral polyp uh, without that colonial uh, nature to it. They're soft, so they're not uh, skeleton producing, um, which makes it impossible for us to study some aspects of ocean acidification, one really hot topic in coral biology right now. Um, but in terms of looking at the cellular biology and the physiology, uh, these sea anemones are very reminiscent of, of corals. And so that makes it a lot easier to study in the lab. We can smush these under a microscope slide. We can grind them up really easily, uh, extract the bacteria and symbiodinium, no problem. Uh, they produce asexually, just as corals. So we can get uh, clonal derived lines from a single polyp. And now we have these clonal lines of thousands of individuals that are all um, genetically homogeneous. And so we can ask questions um, in these individuals while maintaining the same genotype. Very difficult to do in natural populations of coral. We've also now ge generated a lot of transcriptomic and now genomic resources. So the genome was published just last year. Um, so now we have a wealth of sequencing data that we can also go in um, and understand some of the genes that we're looking at. Uh, there's uh, a lot of emphasis right now to get CRISPR and other genome engineering strategies to, to work. Uh, another great feature is that these guys are symbiotic with the same types of symbiodinium uh, as we see in coral. So we can actually take symbiodinium from coral, infect them into Aptasia, get stable symbioses, and again, ask these same kind of partnership uh, interactions that go. And then the best thing uh, for my work has been that we can culture these guys in either the symbiotic or aposymbiotic state. And so aposymbiotic, I mean devoid of all of the algal symbionts. So they get their brown color, again, from the, the pigments, the photosynthetic pigments from the algae. We can cure them of all of their symbionts, um, not bacteria yet. So I'll just put that out there. They're not germ-free. So they do contain their bacteria, but we can remove all of the symbiodinium. And then that allows us to take some of these novel symbiodinium strains, add them back into that aposymbiotic state, form novel combinations, and then ask questions about um, their physiology. And then, of course, we can utilize the autofluorescence of the chlorophyll pigment to visualize these guys under epifluorescence microscopy uh, and, and use the, this fluorescence to actually quantify the number of symbiodinium inside. Um, you'll see the, the endogenous green fluorescence here. We're not sure. We're pretty sure it's not GFP based on the genome sequence now. Um, so we've got this mystery green fluorescence that doesn't seem to be um, GFP, but we're not sure what it is. But we do see this endogenous. And we see it a little bit in the, the symbiotic strains as well. So as a grad student, I wanted to start using Aptasia as a model system because I was interested in how this opportunistic pathogen, Serratia marcescens, is able to cause disease in acroperid corals. So how can it establish itself in an otherwise healthy coral that should have a, a suite of bacteria that are normally associated with it, but how is this pathogen able to come in and start causing a disease? And so this disease is marked by these uh, sporadic splotches that happen across, or pox, that happen across the coral colony. These are really rapidly spreading, so at a rate of about 2.5 centimeters per day, can spread across an entire colony. And these are contagious across um, the acroperid species. So they don't hop between species, but of individual acropora palmata on a reef, you can get pretty uh, quick spreading of this pathogen across the, the, across the colonies. Uh, 
And so I was really interested in how this, this human pathogen made its way out into the, the reef environment. Other people have done some source tracking to show that it actually was through mismanagement of sewage runoff in the Florida Keys, introduced it into the environment after these corals were already decimated from other diseases, so they were already kind of immunocompromised, and then that allowed this new pathogen to, to make its way out. And so some of the first studies that we did was just to take this pathogen at similar doses that we knew were infectious to coral and simply put them on our sea anemones and ask, do they infect at the similar rate and do we see the same type of disease progression? And so this is work that was done by an undergraduate intern at the time, Nick uh, Gimbroni, who's now actually getting his PhD at USF uh, Tampa campus, um, switched out away from corals and wanted to study cancer. So I lost, lost him to the, the cancer side of the world, but that's okay. Um, so what Nick did here is we've got just individual Aptasia. This is a, just a black white image of these guys. Um, we can grow them in really, so when I was saying they're easy to maintain in the lab, uh, we literally keep them in plastic Tupperware uh, on the tabletop and change water maybe once or twice a week. And so you can't do that with coral, right? You need constant flow in seawater and nitrate concentrations and phosphate levels. These guys, you put them in seawater, you feed them, you put them in light. Perfect system for undergraduate study. Um, <laughs> or graduate study, or postdoc for that matter. Um, and so you can, we can keep these guys in even six well dishes of a, of a petri plate. And under control conditions, we can see that the tentacles are out, um, normal, they're not losing symbiodinium, um, not producing extra melanin. And then we infected at different concentrations of our pathogen up to 10 to the 8 uh, CFU. And we can see that after 24 hours at the highest concentration and throughout, we start to get retraction of the tentacles. We get um, ultimately tissue necrosis is the final stage of this disease, just as we see in coral. So you'll actually end up with kind of a soup of, of degraded anemone um, that starts to smell really bad after a few days. Um, and so from these experiments, uh, we can, can quantify this using Kaplan-Meier survival analysis. And we see that we get basically 100% mortality at the highest concentration and uh, ultimately arrived at a lethal dose of 50% concentration um, at about 5 times 10 to the 7 CFU per mil, which is on the order of what we see from infected corals. So if we're isolating this ratio from an infected colony, um, that's a concentration that we typically see. And so this was a promising first step to show, okay, we do get disease at the same level and we ultimately see the same uh, phenotype of uh, this is a tissue necrotic disease. So then what we wanted to ask is, so we see that they are, um, are susceptible by infection of opportunistic pathogens. This is especially true for serratia. We tested this with other coral pathogens. So we tested Vibrio species, um, both cultured individual isolates, but also we went out to infected colonies um, of yellow bandities. So that's a polymicrobial consortia of a mixture of Vibrios, uh, isolated those bands and infected polyps, and we see the same, uh, the same thing. And then so we wanted to ask, how are the pathogens actually establishing on the surface of the Aptasia and actually interacting with the bacteria that are normally there to start causing the um, disease? And then how are these coral-associated bacteria actually playing a role in maybe uh, thwarting some of this uh, infection and um, progression of these invading pathogens? And so that'll get into the second study here that we actually thought that these coral commensal bacteria are actually capable of either producing antimicrobials and killing the pathogen or interfering with some of the strategies that these bacteria utilize to establish and, and gain a foothold in the coral mucus layer. And so first I need to explain what the coral mucus layer is. And so this is a layer, so all of these, the symbiodinium are producing copious amounts of photosynthate, right? Those are being shunted to the coral host, used for its own metabolism. That photosynthate is an excess to what the coral actually needs, and it secretes a lot of this as mucus through specialized mucus, uh, mucocyte cells. And this mucus bathes the coral colony and serves a variety of functions. Um, it acts as a sunscreen, um, protects against UV stress, can act as a desiccant stress preventer if the corals are exposed during low tide, if it has this kind of mucus snot that's covering it, uh, protects it from drying out. It also serves as a really rich environment for microbes to grow in. So again, this is a uh, photosynthate derived fixed carbon rich uh, environment where a lot of these uh, both associated bacteria but also invading bacteria can, can land and take a foothold. 
And so to study, to either isolate bacteria from this mucus layer or to bring this mucus layer back and use it as a growth medium for some of these bacteria, we can go out. Uh, this is actually a picture of me in 2009 on a research cruise with Maya um, to the Dry Tortugas. Uh, Maya was actually the PI on that cruise but wasn't able to go because she was sick. Um, so I got to sn snag a ride on the bellows for a week, which was awesome. Um, so we actually just go down with a, a syringe. We agitate the surface of the coral. That gets them to start sloughing off this. It's literally snot, um, which I've been producing a lot of this week. Um, and you just you suck it up into your syringe. You bring it back, um, stick it in the filter, um, and then you can remove all the microbes from it. And now you've got a rich carbon source that can be used as a growth substrate, which is what I used it for to look at interactions uh, in, in vitro between these opportunistic pathogens and bacteria that we isolated from normal health healthy colonies. And so I took an enzymatic approach first looking at the metabolic activity of our opportunistic pathogen, Serratia marcescens, and its ability to utilize some of the glycosides, or glycosides uh, in this mucus um, and looking at enzymatic activity. So this is just a color-based uh, reaction, enzymatic reaction, looking at average Miller units here. And so if we grow the bacteria either on marine broth or in coral mucus, either at 25 or 30 degrees, we see huge amounts of activity in terms of glycosidase activity uh, in this pathogen grown on coral mucus. And so this was our first indication that, yes, this pathogen is actually utilizing components of the coral mucus and probably maybe more efficiently than some of the bacteria that are natively associated um, with the coral. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of, of these kind of studies because these have all been published, but this was basically our first indication that they are using glycosides in the coral mucus, and we actually show that they're actually using them at different temporal time frames than some of the bacteria normally associated with it. So this is our hypothesis, is that this is a way that they have a, a, the ability to gain that ecological foothold by utilizing some of these sugars when some of the other bacteria are not, able to get in, utilize them faster, and then start uh, progressing uh, towards a disease state. But then, of course, we know that there are many, many different species of bacteria associated with the surface of coral. And we isolated many of these and had them in cultured libraries. And so we wanted to see how are they interacting with this pathogen. And so this is, again, just kind of uh, a more phenotypic look at uh, some of these enzymatic activities. So this is just looking at beta-galactosidase activity in the pathogen, um, putting Xgal in our, in our agar substrate. If the bacteria is able to utilize um, beta-galactose, uh, then we see this blue color production. So here's our pathogen, and here's just an E. coli strain um, with the beta-galactosidase enzyme present in it as our positive control.